I've been using Blender for a few years now, so I wanted to put together this video on 10 things I wish I knew when I first started Blender. So let's jump right into it. The first thing is pie or marking menus. In Blender, you can press comma, period, shift spacebar, Q, just to name a few to get to easily accessible tools and settings. There are even some in edit mode. For example, if I jump in here, and press tab to enter edit mode. You can see I was just messing with pivots earlier, so if I wanted to reset that pivot to the global orientation, I can press comma and then jump to global. If I wanted to do some actual modeling, I can select the face here, and you can see if I want to do something that involves face manipulation or face tools, I can press control F for any of the context sensitive face tools. So I can press extrude and there we go. Now, even if I'm in face mode, if I, let's say, delete this face, of course, I know I can fill hole and whatnot, but if I wanted to get my edge tools, you can select, you can go to edge mode, select your edges, press control E, and so now you have all of the edge tools, which is very similar to how Maya works. So once I figured out how to use this, it really sped up my workflow. And just for another example, quick favorites is incredibly useful because I use this all the time. For example, I know you can go up here, you can change origins, and then you can start manipulating your origins of your specific objects. If I want to skip that step, I can just press shift right mouse button and you can see I can move the cursor. Now while holding shift right mouse button, I can press tab and then now I'm in snap mode and you can see I have vertex snap over here. And so I've just snapped the cursor to this vertex and then I can press Q origin to 3D cursor and boom, I've just moved the pivot in just a few seconds. So now I can rotate about that pivot. So just a quick example of how you can use all of these pie menus and marking menus throughout Blender. All right, the next one is grouping in Blender or the lack of groups. So what Blender has is collections. So you can see I have a few objects in this scene and I can put them in a collection. So I can select these primitives, press M for the hotkey and then do new collection and it'll automatically add these to a collection. So I'll say collection one, hit okay. And so now anything inside of this collection can be toggled, can have the visibility toggled and whatnot. Now, the annoying thing is that this is just a scene collection, meaning I cannot manipulate it inside of the viewport. So if I press G to move, you can see nothing is moving, right? So my workaround for this is to put any of these objects that are in a collection inside of an empty. So I'll deselect everything, press Shift A, go down to empty and just do plain axes. And so now you can see if I press Alt Z, I'm in x-ray mode and I can see the empty here. I can select these primitives and then make sure that the empty is the last object I have selected. Then I can press control P and then set parent to object and there we go. And if I put this empty inside of that collection, you'll see that everything falls inside of that empty. Now, why do I go about it this way? Because if I want to, let's say, hide everything inside of this empty, well, I disable visibi visibility and you can see everything stays visible because the only thing that is hiding is the empty. So you can see the eye. But if I have this all in a collection, then I can disable the visibility. You could double click on the empty like this and then hide and disable visibility that way. But it's just a little bit more work than, than what I'd like. So I use a combination of empties and collections and that's gotten me by so far without using any add-ons for groups. So far so good, it's been working pretty well. Next is layer toggles or restriction toggles. For example, if you want to go in and not only disable the visibility, but you want to disable the selection, the way that you can do this is if you head up top and you see this little filter icon. This filter icon shows restriction toggles and there's this little compass looking arrow and I now always have that on at the start of a project. So I enable that and this creates what's called selectable or it's like freezing and unfreezing layers inside of Maya or 3ds Max. So now not only do I have the render icon, the visibility icon, now I have a selectable icon. So I can keep these visible inside of the viewport, but now I can't select them, which is nice. So having those things make it really easy to organize and manage your projects. All right, so for this next tip, it's setting up an HDRI. In most software, setting up an HDRI is very similar to setting up any sort of light. 
So you can create that as a dome light, but you can see here when I first started, light, point, sun, spot, and area, there is nothing for HDRI. Instead, the way Blender views HDRIs is the world environment, which can be found here in the settings. Now, what I'll do is jump over to the shading tab here. So now we can set up our HDRI. So in order to do that, you switch from object to world. So now this is the world environment texture or the HDRI texture that we're going to be using. Then I press shift A and do a quick search and type in environment texture, not texture, environment texture. So I add that there and then connect the yellow pins and then I go look for my texture or HDRI texture. So I have one of these studio HDRIs. So I will select that, hit open image, and then I view it in the viewport. Now what you'll notice is the viewport doesn't change. The viewport actually is just using kind of a default or a preset HDRI. So if you want to now view this in the viewport, change this to scene world, and there you go. This is the HDRI or the studio HDRI that we have set up. Then if you wanna manipulate this HDRI, just select the studio, and then you can add some transform components, but I use an add-on called Node Wrangler, which we'll talk about in the next step, but I press Control T, and then now I can adjust the rotation just like I would in any 3D software. Then if I go back to my viewport, if you switch to kind of the material view, and then you can show the world opacity here and then change the blur. So now we can change, or sorry, I blurred it too much. I wanna reduce the blur. Now we can view it by using scene world. And so now again, it just behaves just like it would inside of my 3ds Max and, and anywhere. So a few extra steps, but I remember having to look at this step like 10 times before it finally set in. So you can also modify it again right here once you have it set up in the settings so I can change the mapping and whatnot all here directly. So I don't have to keep jumping back to the shading. Quick interruption, if you've clicked on this video, you're probably interested in 3D modeling and topology. So I'm excited to announce that I'm putting together a 3D modeling topology masterclass. Whether you're a beginner or an advanced user, this is going to help improve your skills in 3D modeling. This is just the first course, and trust me, you're in good hands. I'm an industry professional and I've been teaching for over 15 years. And I have some of the most popular topology videos on my YouTube. And this is going to be one of the first of many courses on my platform. I will be covering the entire 3D art pipeline, starting with modeling all the way through rendering for both offline and real-time rendering. So stay tuned and be sure to check out my Patreon for early access information. So I'll see you there. Okay, so this next one is kind of a blitz of a bunch of add-ons that I use. All of these are completely free and most of them can be found directly in Blender. As I brought up in the last tip, Node Wrangler is incredibly powerful. There's tons of tools, hotkeys, and it's a great way to speed up your material graph workflows. Modifier list. When you have a whole bunch of modifiers on a bunch of different objects, this tool does a very good job of sifting through all of your modifiers with a nice, clean tool set loop tools. This is one that I installed like day one because it has a lot of tools that I'm used to using like circle, which is circularize in Maya, flatten, relax, and space. All of these I use all the time. So make sure to enable this right out of the gate. Set flow. You can find this one online, but it's completely free made by Benjamin Sauter. So you can install this super quick. It does a great job setting the flow of edges, kind of like interpolating between two endpoints. So instead of trying to manually create a good flow of edges, this tool does it for you automatically. UV Packer, this one can be found online and is super helpful. Blender's default packer works pretty well, but this one is free and does an amazing job utilizing as much UV space and has a bunch of tools that I regularly use, especially when setting up UV maps for my game ready assets. All right, on to the next one, which is modifying pivots. I brought up earlier on how to use a 3D cursor. So to recap, if you hold shift right click, you can move the 3D cursor anywhere. And then with your object selected, you can go up to the top if you don't have this to quick favorites and Blender calls pivots origin so you can set origin and then you can do origin to 3d cursor here or if you'd like to manually modify the pivot yourself then you can go up here where it says options and then affect only origins so now if i press shift spacebar and get my move tool now i can kind of manually manipulate this anywhere in the viewport and again if i turn on my snapping 
and I like to use vertex snapping here. You can snap this to a specific vertex on your object if that's what you'd like to do. And it's affecting that in real time. And then you can just exit that mode and you're good to go. So that's how you quickly edit pivots in Blender or Origins. The next one you've probably heard already, but it's apply scale. And I still do this to this day. If I take this cube and scale in one axis, like in the Y axis. Now, if I hit N to open up my panel, you see that I have a scale applied. Now if I hit tab, and let's say I want to bevel this corner here and I hit control B to bevel, look what happens to this bevel. What it's doing now is it's, it's applying that transform that we have here. So it's applying that scale transform to the bevel. So if we don't want it to do that, then you hit A, apply scale. So now I'll hit the numpad slash and I jump into edit mode. Now, if I bevel this, now you can see this is properly beveling and then you can just scroll up on the mouse wheel and you can add a bunch of bevels. Compare that with that initial one and it works great or it works exactly as it's supposed to. For this next tip is edge slide and normal move. So if I select Suzanne here, the monkey, go into edit mode, and let's say now I want to adjust these edges and vertices. Well, the way that I can do that, instead of manually selecting these edges, and let's say I want to just move this with my move tool and start to manually move that, disabling snapping, of course. You know, you have some control over here, but if you want to slide these on the edges, well, you press GG, as in grab. And there you go. And now it's sliding along edges, which is really nice. And what's super nice and super powerful is you see how this yellow line here, it's maybe a little bit hard to see. Let me kind of zoom in. So I'll zoom in, hit GG, and you see this yellow line? Well, if I want to go past, you can press C. And so now it'll continue that based off of that tangent point, which is again, really, really powerful. And I haven't seen that in other modeling suites. So that was super nice to find out. The other one is moving on normal. So I can select these vertices and let's say I wanna give these faces some volume, right? So I go in and I select some faces here and I don't really wanna scale up because I don't like the way that that's scaling. Instead, I can do Alt S and I can start to move on the normal of these objects. And you can see how it's doing a better job on adding volume. So sometimes I'll use scale and sometimes I'll use move on normal. So incredibly, incredibly powerful. All right, and another tip is I had no idea until probably this past year that you can extrude only vertices. So for example, if I take a plane and I jump into edit mode, select all of these vertices, I'm gonna merge them at the center, then tab to exit, and then G to move. So now we have just this dot or this vertice here, okay? Now I can put this back on the origin. I'll put it back on the zero zero origin and I'll hit numpad slash and then I'll hit tab to enter edit mode. So what we can do now is we have this dot or it's our vertice and I can press E for extrude and there you go. This is incredibly, incredibly useful when you're creating more organic hard surface objects and I'm putting together a series of tutorials on car modeling and you better believe that I use this feature all the time. So for example, what I can do is continue to extrude these vertices so I can take all of these edges now press shift D to duplicate and just move these on the, press X to move it on the X axis, great. And then I can go back to kind of edge mode, excuse me, vertex mode, and just start to manipulate these vertices here. And so what we can do is bridge these along and you can do a nice kind of bridge or loft between these two points. So one way to do that is I can select this vertice, extrude, and I while I'm moving, I don't have snapping enabled, but I can hit tab or shift tab and snap to that vertice there. I can do that again, E to move this vertice, press shift tab, and then snap to that vertex. So now I can just select these vertices and just do a merge at center. Or I can select all of them and just do a merge by distance with a pretty low distance like, yeah, 0 0.0001 meter. Then I can actually go in here. Now I have a vertex with an edge and I can add this. So now, Let's get on to the next tip, which is grid fill. 
Grid Fuel is an incredibly powerful tool that I'm super happy that I found out about. So I can manipulate these vertices like so, and you can see I'm going to add in, hopefully it's a little bit easy to see, but I'm going to add in a few more vertices here. And the key thing is, you'll notice I kind of duplicated and moved, is that you want to make sure that you have this same of vertices from one side to the other. In this case, I just have two vertices on one side versus the other, which is great. So I can select all of these. I have three there. Oh yeah, so three, three, great. So I'll select all of these vertices, press Control F and go to grid fill and boom, there you go. And it does such a great job maintaining the curvature from the front to the end and interpolating between these. And like I said, you better believe that I'm gonna be covering this in some car modeling series that I'll be putting together. All right, so those are 10 tips that I wish I knew when I first started Blender. So to support the channel, be sure to check out the Patreon where you'll get access to a bunch of my source files, access to the Discord, and one-on-one -on -one chats to help you grow as an artist. Also, stay tuned because I've got a new course coming focusing on mastering topology. So make sure to follow and subscribe for more information coming soon. I'll see you around.